The farthest extreme of this kind of individualism is where personal lifestyle becomes personal purity, and identity itself is declared some kind of a political act. Um, and this is where subcultures start to feel like cults. I think a lot of you know what I mean. Um, but any strategy based on individual change is doomed to fail because oppression is not an individual condition. It's a group condition, and it will require group action. So um, the defining characteristic of the oppositional culture is that it consciously claim, claims to be that cradle of resistance. Um, OK, so here we have this, you know, this, this list of the kind of adolescent concerns. Um, and the thing to know is that the adolescent brain is still under construction. They used to think that our brains were built by the time we were 12. It's completely not true. The brain may reach a certain size by the time you're 12, but all kinds of stuff is going on for another 10 years in there. Um, but basically, the areas that are responsible for impulse control, for planning, especially long-range planning, for considering consequences, and for managing emotional states, they go offline a lot when you're a teenager. So adolescents cannot understand cause and effect. It's just it's their brains cannot make the connection. Um, and they're really bad at long-term consequences. So they're prone to risk-taking, um, these lightning flashes of anger, really impulsive behavior, um, and overall emotional intensity. And that's really the hallmarks of the age, right? This is the phase of life when this question of who I am takes on such extraordinary importance. And there is nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's your job when you're 15, right, is to figure out who you are and, and what you're going to be with yourself, what you're going to do. Um, you know, the problem is, though, when um, you know, that takes over and becomes the sort of guiding um, you know, principle of this whole culture. Um, so the idea of authority is rejected out of hand, whereas a serious resistance movement would, in fact, be training appropriate people for leadership. Um, and on the alternative culture, the enemy is seen as this constraining set of values. Um, conventions are the problem, rather than systems of power. Um, and so their main program is one of attacking boundaries rather than injustice. And this has had serious consequences ac across the left. It's been pretty much a disaster for women and girls. Um, the creators of this counterculture weren't just any teenagers. They were uh, you know, middle class, they were privileged, and they were male. Um, you know, this is not necessarily a great combo. Um, now, alienation may be a good place to start. I mean, you have to start somewhere. With, you know, this, this world is not working for me. Why? So I think you know, a lot of us started this, this sort of the path that we are on by feeling alienated as teenagers, you know, and so we start to question. And that's what teenagers do really well. But it can't stop there. Um, because to build a resistance movement, you need loyalty and you need solidarity. And alienated individuals are by definition alienated. Okay? They can't do loyalty and solidarity. You've got to kind of get over that and start to make common cause with people. Um, second half of my chart. Um, okay, yeah, this concern of identity, who I am, it takes on this importance um, that outweighs what one might actually do. Um, now, the counterculture as we know it is a product of the psychology, and that's where it's been permanently stuck. Um, the concerns of adolescence, so the gifts and the shortcomings of the age, are the framework for the alternative culture. And those community norms and habits have become accepted across the left in what Theodore Rosak calls a progressive adolescentization of dissenting thought and culture. He said that in 1968, I think. So <laughs> it's really great when you find out, like, oh, somebody else thought of this. But then you're like, well, I'm like 40 years behind already. I mean, he already had this down. So, yes, um, the progressive adolescentization of dissenting thought and culture. And he was absolutely right. So this is the motto of the Van der Vogel. <laughs> Not joking. This was their motto. Um, same characters, different costumes. Abby Hoffman, Revolution for the Hell of It. Now, on the positive side, the gifts of youth are that incredible moral vigor, that fearless courage, the passion, the idealism, right? Every movement needs an infusion of the constant infusion of those things. Um, and, you know, honestly, by the time you're 30, it's pretty well over. You know, you need the young people to come and give you that again. But the alternative culture stops that vigor from effective action. And when you can't fight power, all you can fight is each other. So this is what Florence Kennedy called uh, horizontal hostility. And this is our diagram. So in the first panel, um, the king has all the power, and he's really happy because the little people haven't figured out they can fight. The second panel, they've made solidarity with each other, and they're fighting back. There's resistance. King is not happy. In the third panel, they've cut off any concept of resistance. So they don't, they, they don't believe they can fight up that hierarchy. All they can do is fight with each other. So horizontal hostility is, is you know, what they're left with. Um, this can be a feeding frenzy of things like ugly gossip, character assassination, in more militant groups. Um, it can end with paranoid accusations. And in really the worst instances, it ends with people shooting each other. Um, ultimately, it's caused by fighting horizontally rather than fighting vertically you know, up the hierarchy. But if the only thing we can change is ourselves, um, and if our best tactic for social change is lifestyle changes, then indeed examining and critiquing the minutia of people's lives 
feels like um, a righteous activity. Um, if in the end it reminds you a little bit of junior high school, well, there's a reason for it. Um, and the final thing with the, uh, the Von der Vogel, um, they create this, the, the whole romantic movement, they create this image of the peasant. So the peasants are supposed to be authentic and anti-rational and in touch with nature and semi-mystical. Um, their idea of a peasant had nothing to do with actual peasants who did in fact exist in Germany and could have used some help. Um, now the von der Vogel gets transplanted to the United States. There aren't any peasants in the U.S. So instead they take the same template and they apply it to two groups. They get pressed into service for the needs of the privileged and, um, oops, wrong way. Um, Generally, it's Native Americans and African Americans who get cast as emotional and natural and authentic and childlike and all this. I'm really hoping I don't have to explain what's wrong with this picture. Okay, chart again. Um, so on the side of the alternative, this cultural appropriation becomes the norm, where everybody's spiritual practices are basically your shopping mall. Because honestly, if the main goal is just to feel better about yourself and have personal transformation, well, why not just use what works? It's just completely depoliticized. Um, on the side of an actual oppositional culture, of course, um, you know, the main task would be to protect indigenous communities with whatever solidarity we can offer and certainly to keep sacred ceremonies from exploitation and abuse. So, um, so that's uh, pretty much the alternative oppositional. Um, the, there are plenty of successful resistance movements who have created cultures of resistance that worked long term. The people over 30 generally lay a lot of the groundwork. So that's often for a generation or two. In the civil rights movement, you had two groups. You had the Harlem Renaissance, and then you had the Pullman Porters. And they added different things into this mix. Um, the Pullman Porters were like the, the bridge between slavery and the civil rights movement. They took a culture of survival, which you know, was hard enough, but they start to build a culture of resistance from that. And so along the way, they're accumulating some really important things, self-respect, cultural pride, political experience, and material resources. The Pullman Porters were like anchors in the black community because they had good jobs that had a lot of security. Um, and so all of that was necessary. And then you get the next generation, you get the college students who are willing to you know, sit down at the lunch counters and face the angry mob. Um, and then this, the four guys who kicked this off were all freshmen. They were college freshmen. They were 18 years old. By the time this was done, 70,000 college students had done sit-ins across the South. They were calling it the Second Civil War. That's how many people participated in this. So these were, you know, 18, 19 year olds. Then you've got even younger kids. This is the Children's Crusade, right? I mean, the world was electrified by these pictures. You know, the fact that anybody would turn a fire hose on a 12 year old. Um, and then even younger. This is little Ruby Bridges. She's a single handedly desegregating the Louisiana public school system. Yeah. And, you know, I got to say that we got no right to be standing on the sidelines wringing our hands. We can't do anything. It's all too much. When a six year old can produce this kind of courage, right? I think she's amazing. She's got an autobiography. You can read her memoir about, you know, what this was like. Um, the British suffragists follow a really similar pattern in that you've got these three generations of women who are doing um, all this work about suffrage and abolition and labor, labor movement, and they don't get very far, but they're accumulating all kinds of resources and political experience. Um, the Pankers in Britain were um, just phenomenal leaders of this movement, and they had been involved for three generations in this whole struggle, but Emmeline, who really became one of the leaders, um, when she was five years old, she had um, Uncle Tom's Cabin read to her as a bedtime story. Like, that's a culture of resistance. And they were trained in this movement, like how to think politically. This great quote, young as I was, I could not have been older than five years old. I knew perfectly well the meaning of the words slavery and emancipation. Right? Now in turn, she raises her daughters, Christabel and Emmeline, to be part of the struggle. They used to cry because they were too young to go to political meetings. <laughs> it was so sweet. And at one point, young Christabel says to her mom, how long you women have been trying for the vote? For my part, I mean to get it. And Emmeline writes in her journal, was there a difference between trying for the vote and getting the vote? And she realizes what she has to do. She's got to create an organization that puts together the experience, the accumulated wisdom of the women who've been doing this for generations with that fearless courage of the young, you know, with her daughter saying, we're not going to lose, we've got to do this. If she, could, if she could make an organization that combined those two things, they would win. And she was absolutely right, and that was what she did. Um, the WSPU was born, and they engage in first massive civil disobedience. They completely up the stakes. Um, they, they, they hound members of parliament and the prime minister. Um, and they were arrested, they went to jail, and they went to prison, and they were tortured. Um, they're, they're, a specific law was passed by parliament that let them be tortured. It even used the female pronoun, so the prisoner she. Um, 
Uh, it's called the Cat and Mouse Act. Um, and when that didn't work, uh, Christabel escalated the troops to arson. So they did, they blew up golf courses and mailboxes, historic buildings and railway stations all across England. Um, that was how women won the vote. You don't get to learn that in school, but that was what they did. <laughs>